Hey guys, today I'm here with Samantha Berkowitz, registered dietitian, and we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects that I actually don't get to talk about very often on the podcast. This is only maybe the second episode I've done on the topic of food and how terrible diet culture is and how we should just really, the most, the best thing I think we could do, should do, uh, when we're trying to figure out our diet habits, I don't even like the word diet because they've mm -hmm. they've tainted it so badly. And it's come to mean things that you do for a little bit of time and it's structured mm -hmm. and it's limiting and it's stressful, which is counterproductive to the weight loss that most people are trying to do. But I don't think we should focus on weight loss. I think we should just be healthy. And that looks different for every person. But mindfulness is what I feel like we should do mindful intuitive eating you know step by step eat one thing and then check in with your body and see how it feels and how it likes it does it does it not because stemming off of that the uh the internet's a great thing we have so much access to information these days but it'll also drown you in the things they say are bad for you and it'll leave you feeling like you're not allowed to eat anything. And I, I don't I don't want any of us to subscribe to that. I want us to like check in with our bodies and like, is this something that you do okay with? Absolutely. I think, yeah, social media and like you said, the internet has become a place where anyone and anyone can share their opinion, right? Which, and there is a place for that and that's important. And it also allows people that kind of you know put out their opinion as fact when that's just not the case and saying that oh xyz food isn't good for you here's why it's bad for you and honestly like without going into every single food that is on this planet just kind of saying like the stress and overwhelm you feel about picking the quote-unquote right food is more harmful to your body and that stress than any food ever could be. Um, and I think just the amount of brain space that a lot of us allow food and our body to take up is overwhelming and is limiting us from doing other things. Um, I definitely have experience with that kind of a little bit about me. So I became a dietitian, mostly unknowing to myself, but I wanted to, you know, figure out the quote unquote right way to eat, the perfect way to eat, how to be the healthiest. Um, and unfortunately, that's a very common story for a lot of dietitians saying, well, you know, I don't now, but I started this journey um, having a disordered relationship with food mm -hmm. and kind of thinking I was going to find that right way and that healthiest way. And even as a nutrition major, like in college, I thought I was kind of I guess I didn't really know what diet culture was, but I kind of, yeah, went in thinking that I was going to be an expert in nutrition and learn that magic. And what I didn't know was learning about BMI and how to teach people how to lose weight, quote unquote, really got into my head as a young adult. And I started creating my own calorie ranges for myself while working out more than I ever had before and slowly started using things like my fitness pal to track every morsel of food that went in my mouth, um, buying a food scale you know, measuring the serving size of chips and, you know, right down to the gram and being super rigid with that. Um, and honestly, you know, looking back, it was that rigid mindset felt really safe. And that's what a lot of people find dieting to be, you know, like, oh, well, I don't have any control of my eating. So if I follow these rules, then I'm going to like, that will keep me inbounds, Right. But really what we find is that that those strict, rigid rules, which tend to get more rigid over time, actually have that opposite effect. It actually makes us kind of want to like swing the other way and be like, you know, screw this. Like, I'm just going to do whatever I want because our we don't like to follow rules. Like, have you ever told a kid not to touch like the breakable thing in the store? Like, what do they want to do? Right. So it's kind of the same thing with us as adults with food, like we don't, our brain and psychology at the baseline is still that young child. Like when you're like, no chips, no carbs, your body's like, well, that's exactly I don't really care. One. Right. I don't really <laughs> care what you have to say. Like, that's what I want now. And now we're going to like that desire for that because it's forbidden is going to be like 
on a hundred. Yeah, we like freedom just as mm-hmm. like as people. And uh, yeah. also following the rules. You know, m- I, I mentioned that I like mindful intuitive eating, but mm-hmm. in the safety constructs of a rigid diet, uh, you know, touching on that and how people feel safe mm-hmm. in that, the mindful intuitive eating puts all the responsibility on you. And yes. that is something that people are also terrified of. We want freedom. We want freedom to choose and do what we want and don't tell me how to be and what to do. <laughs> but but also, can you please tell me what to do and how what to be? To do. Exactly. That's, you know, I actually just got off a call with a client and she was saying that, you know, she's experiencing what I like to call is the messy middle. So kind of when you're like, okay, I'm done dieting, right? I don't want to follow these rules, but I also don't know what it means to like, what does intuitive eating mean? How do I listen to my body? Like, so you kind of throw all the rules out the window and you are eating whatever, how much you want, right? And, but without being kind of in tune with your body and that's kind of how we learn. And I think a lot of people have to go through that messy middle once they've been dieting for a long time to kind of be like, okay, well, what does feel good for my body and what doesn't, right? Um, And that tends to be similar to people that have maybe binge ate for a while, Um, like on cookies, you're going to buy those cookies, you're going to keep them in the house and you're going to eat a lot of cookies. Eventually your body's going to be like, okay, enough with the cookies. I want a salad or I want something else. And that's how we learn how to get in tune is kind of by trying and I don't like to say failing, but learning from our body to like, okay, that many cookies was too many cookies for me. Right. And where our boundaries are around that. And that can be really scary for people because, you know, that means giving into that, like potentially overeating for a while until we can really tune back in with ourselves. Um, but yeah, it's definitely that middle area is where a lot of people sit for a while, but I think it's necessary to kind of relearn those hunger fullness cues, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, just learning our body cues in general. Totally. Because most mm-hmm. most of us don't we know yeah. we weren't raised to know that we're supposed <laughs> to listen to our bodies. What do you mean right? listen to our bodies? It's not making any noises. What do you mean? And right. uh, <clears throat> so you know, they'll we'll we'll eat the cookies and we'll eat the cookies and we'll eat the cookies and then we'll start feeling so bad. And it doesn't even cross our minds that it might be the cookies. You know, yeah. And I think I think like And that's something to say, like, I think all foods can fit, but right, the variety in our diet is important too. So the cookies have a place and so does the salad and so does the vegetables and so does the pizza, right? But just like eating one of anything, even if it was apples, right? Like you're not going to feel very good if all you eat is apples. So I think, yeah, the focusing on the variety is super important over like, And like what, like you said, makes your body feel good or doesn't feel good versus trying to follow these rigid rules. Just say like, I'm never going to, for some reason, like the internet hates oatmeal right now. Um, And saying like, I'm never eating oatmeal again. Like it's bad for you. Um, I mean, I just think, yeah, it puts a lot of stress on us that we don't need. And kind of like you mentioned, like we were never taught that. Like, I think a lot of us were raised on clean plate club, um, eating past fullness and you know, maybe it came from a good place, like whether that was because, you know, your family experienced food insecurity and, you know, you had to make all that food function for you or just because that's how they were raised and they want to make sure you're getting enough. Just because it comes from a good place doesn't mean overriding our hunger cues doesn't have an effect later. And since we never, like you said, we're taught to what does hunger feel like besides a grumbling stomach? That is like, the thing I work on clients with the most because they're like okay if my stomach's not grumbling how do I know I'm hungry because some people that just isn't something that really happens and it's more like a headache or feeling extreme fatigue or tiredness that is that hunger cue for them but you know that's I feel like in society that's where it's like well grab your coffee you're tired right like don't eat food that would (laughs) that wouldn't make sense um But yeah, just kind of really going back to the basics and learning like what our body needs and what are those signals? Because sometimes we're like, okay, I know it makes me feel good, but like, when am I even hungry? Like, I don't even know what that means. 
There's so many points that I could touch on that. And I would probably talk the rest of the episode. (laughs) But so for one, you're exactly correct with the uh, hunger cue problems. I experience that and Mm -hmm. fall into the and and also gosh there's so many tangents I could go on right now literally (laughs) um I I have I've struggled with food my whole life Mm -hmm. um I have neurodivergent Mm -hmm. struggles which lead me to be um I'm not a picky eater but I do Mm -hmm. hyper fixate on things And then I'll, so I'll eat the same thing because also I'm hypoglycemic, so I have to eat regularly, but also I'm allergic to soy. So I have, there's only a limited amount of things that I can eat. And then, um, my body doesn't like dairy. And, uh, so sometimes like, it's weird, but so I'll find something that I can eat finally. Oh, and then you got the whole, um, everything's bad for you. So I hyper fixated on that for a really long time. And uh, I have, again, this is is a hundred tangents if you can keep up, but I was the chubby kid growing up Mm -hmm. and it's funny because we think we know what healthy eating is, but we don't Mm -hmm. actually know what healthy eating is until we start practicing it. So Mm -hmm. back in the nineties, healthy eating was like, all we knew was eat a salad. So Mm -hmm. In an effort to counteract my chubbiness, uh, there was this whole period of time where I was only allowed to eat salads, but it was fried chicken salads drenched in ranch and cheese and all of the, so like it wasn't making a bit of difference, right? And uh, so I stopped eating because I was tired of salads and I was like, well, this yeah. isn't working anyway, so I'm just going to stop eating. So I just stopped eating and then I got the the weight goals that everybody was wanting, but um, I think that had a hand in messing up my hunger cues because I suppressed the hunger cues for so long and so now I don't always catch them because I don't always Mm -hmm. feel hungry uh like you said I'll feel I'll just feel sick I'll just feel sick Mm -hmm. or bad or tired or something like that and then you know the hardest thing about in doing anything is remembering to do it. And so instead of remembering that this might, I might need to eat something, I'll be like, man, I'm, I'm going to go lay down and take a nap and see if that helps. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it doesn't. Yeah. And then right. like three or four hours will go by of me. I'm like, well, let me take a bath. Let me see if a shower will help. And it doesn't. And then, you know, it'll be time for dinner and I'll eat something in like three bites in. I'm like, oh, oh suddenly I feel completely better but you know again you got to talk to your body a little bit better Mm -hmm. than what even the best of us do sometimes and yeah it's hard to just remember to but also um on the variety a hyper fixation on the meals that I do will Mm -hmm. cause me to and I had I didn't know this was a thing until recently when Mm -hmm. and I say recently I've started figuring it out over the past like three years or so Mm -hmm. I would eat the same thing every single day and then one day I would eat it and my body would just completely rebel and absolutely Mm -hmm. not and then I won't be able to eat it again for like oatmeal I ate oatmeal every single day for probably three years and now I cannot eat oatmeal anymore and it's not a preference thing it's not a texture bodily mind Mm -hmm. thing if if I eat oatmeal, my heart starts racing. So Mm, yeah, that's interesting. It's interesting that you mentioned like being uh, neurodivergent and having some trouble with your hunger and fullness cues, because that's actually really common um, and why intuitive eating like the traditional framework is super difficult for people that are neurodivergent. I have ADHD and, um, Like, even though I, this is literally my job, even in instances, like you said, when you hyper fixate on a task and like, I'm just like all in, I'll forget to eat. And that's when I feel that really tired. I'm like, why can't I like keep my eyes open? Like what is happening? I don't understand. It's like, oh, well, like lunch would have been good. Yeah, probably should go do that. Um, But it takes me a while, even though I kind of have identified what my personal hunger cues are and like what that looks like for me. And even still, like I have instances where it's very difficult 
for me to do that or like like you said remember and be like oh yeah like it's been a while since I ate breakfast even though it feels like no time has passed because I have like time blindness (laughs) um but yeah like it's it really does affect us but we're not really taught that it's kind of like oh this is when you eat breakfast this is when you eat lunch this is when you eat dinner maybe have a snack maybe don't um and it's really difficult um to kind of really understand your own body especially when not everyone's hunger cues are the same or as strong and like you mentioned like when we suppress them because we're either we're dieting or something that's actually also really common for people that are neurodivergent is eating slash cooking feeling like a task and not eating because they put off doing it and not necessarily in a diet culture way but just in a task like way um, and so we're inadvertently suppressing those hunger cues by putting off eating mm-hmm. and that also suppresses them and makes it even more difficult to listen to them. Cause when our body is like, well, you're ignoring me, so I'm just not going to send you these signals. Cause it's like, I'm speaking and you're not listening. Right. And that's really hard to reverse, but we can, it just takes very intentional, like you said, understanding, okay, what does this look like for me? if it's not like a grumbling belly that that's like the only thing we've ever been taught about hunger literally yeah the the neurodivergent task thing i was gonna Mm. bring up before like you beat me to it (laughs) um making a sandwich for neurodivergent people feels like 25 steps Mm -hmm. whereas a neuro like my husband like just make a sandwich what is the big deal just go make a sandwich like you don't understand I have to for one quit doing the tasks that I'm already focused on and then I have to go into the kitchen and then I have to uh get all of the ingredients out and then I have to toast the bread and then I have to slather the mayonnaise like this is too much okay it's too much I have other things I need to be tending to and hope I don't get distracted in the middle of that whole problem yeah so (laughs) you know (laughs) it fluttered away as soon as I thought about it oh 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 so most of us end up going in there and just grabbing a piece of cheese or a pack of crackers Mm because it's easier so Mm -hmm. I've had to put a lot of emphasis on um food prep Mm -hmm. and even that felt like it man man it's been such a long learning curve because mm-hmm. again it's not just cooking I, I don't know maybe that's a neurodivergent thing too is that uh cooking seems so simple to most people and mm-hmm. you just go in there and cook it I burn everything I have studied I have literally studied like read books on YouTube googled all of the Pinterest things followed recipe thing like point by point tried to Mm -hmm. learn how to make food and still struggle with it very very badly and can't tell you what I'm doing wrong I don't know I'll follow the recipe step by step and still mess it up somehow but (laughs) something that has helped me is that is finding really simple things to food prep like um Mm -hmm fruits and vegetables you can take like a whole pack of strawberries or a whole pound of carrots and for stand there for 10 or 15 minutes and Mm -hmm. put them all up and slice them however you like them and put Mm -hmm. them in little single serve containers and then there's your grab and go you just reach in Mm -hmm. there which also leads us to the trap of only eating carrots or only (laughs) you know we're working on it this morning yesterday what I did was I cooked up a uh in my instant pot it only takes a minute to cook up a thing of a quinoa and Mm -hmm. quinoa heats up really really well it's just as good heated up later as it is fresh and then Mm -hmm. I, I chopped up some sweet potatoes and I roasted them in the oven for 20 minutes and then made little mason jar cups of a uh, single serve mm-hmm. breakfast well there this was my lunch I guess because I ate breakfast earlier but quinoa and sweet potatoes with a scoop of sunflower butter and three ingredients ta-da yep super simple yeah 
I love leaning on convenience foods and it's a similar recommendation I make honestly to a lot of my clients, but also ones that are neurodivergent as well. Um, and I am someone that loves Trader Joe's and that's because they have so many freezer slash like mostly prepared options that I can kind of rotate through slash keep on hand that are like you said, like low number of steps, mm-hmm. um, but still kind of have that variety, like some veggies, some chicken or a protein um, and taste good and are a reasonable price. The other thing I really like is I found a Instagram account. I think it's five items or less Trader Joe's or Trader Joe's five items or less. And it's all these recipes with only five items. And so you could probably take a lot of them and use like if you shop at a regular grocery store and not Trader Joe's things. Um, but it is like kind of like you said, it makes it less of a task. And I think cooking so hard for people that are neurodivergent because like you made the example with the sandwich was like it is a lot of steps. So it's like getting to do that already and then also getting distracted while doing that like I'll if I'm making something even though I like to cook I'll like stand over it while it boils or simmers or whatever for 10 minutes and my partner will be like okay well you can like clean up and like do other things while you do and I'm like no I can't (laughs) well for you um yeah (laughs) or like he used to make fun of me because I you know for like boiling like regular box pasta or making mac and cheese I put the timer on the Mm -hmm. microwave and he's like, you don't need to put a timer on, you just taste it when it like until it's done. I go, yes, but I want to try and clean up or do something else while it's boiling for 10 minutes. And if I don't, it's going to be 20 minutes and mm-hmm. the pasta is still going to be boiling. Um, so well. I realized, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's like some of that I've realized is like, it's that multi multitasking barrier, which is a lot of cooking recipes that are maybe not super complex, but are like, okay, while well, this does this, do this. And for us, that's really difficult. Like I can't, you know. So I think finding recipes that are less steps, less ingredients, maybe like one pot or something that is like, okay, I'll put all this effort in now, but I'll have leftovers that reheats well for lunch or the next day is something that's so important to kind of figure out if that's what works for you or those kind of things. It's like, okay, what makes this task easier for me that I can feed myself, get that variety in? And because I don't know about you, but like I can't meal prep in the sense of like eat the same thing for the next three or four days. Like I'm like, okay, like I like that and I'll do leftovers. But I need like, I can't be eating the same thing for lunch and dinner and like we need like a little bit. So yeah, those frozen things like I think are really great and they get a bad rep, but really like Mm -hmm. there are a lot of frozen options that there isn't really like all this added stuff in it. Like it's really just that thing frozen and like you just heat it up and it's the same like as if you made it and froze it at home, you know? Yes, I love frozen meals. The, the convenience items I'm all about that too because you know cooking is hard and um and I don't mean hard just as like complicated but hard to make yeah. yourself get in the, it I, I could not make it a priority for so long because mm-hmm. eating three times a day is obnoxious <laughs> once a day maybe okay I could probably but three times a day are you kidding me I have stuff to do and I have two small children so I mean yeah it, it's too much. It's too much. Uh, absolutely. I think, and I think convenience foods also get a bad rep, but like, it doesn't have to mean just eating Cheez-Its and chips all day. Like those have a place, mm-hmm. but right. We need, that's not a meal. And so I think like also being able to take like certain convenience foods to make a recipe easier. So like, I'm trying to think, I think something I'm making this week is like kind of like a burrito bowl-esque recipe and I wanted like a meat a meat on there a protein but something that's you know not just like put up chicken but I'm not like really wanting to put the effort of like braising meat or like you know like this long process and so I got like the Trader Joe's it's frozen um I think it's the beef burrito but it's basically like shredded beef with like a sauce and so now I can make this but then have like a different 
protein for on top that's like easy and will heat up in 10 minutes like in the pot while I do the rice like sometimes it's just like adding those things in to have some variety but also just to make it a little quicker and not like a whole like you said a whole day ordeal whether you're feeding just yourself or especially when we're feeding others children like I don't have time to spend all day cooking one meal like (laughs) especially not every day like I like to do that when I'm like, okay, this is going to be my hobby for the day, right? But like, not every day. And I think that took a long time for me, like, even though I went to culinary school, and I love to cook, that like, cooking a 10 page recipe every night is not sustainable. And I can't do it. Um, Whether that's because like, my produce dies in the produce drawer, um, (laughs) because I've been too ambitious and bought too many things, or just because like, uh, I'm working and I'm tired after work and I want to eat something that tastes good, but not, I don't want it to take three hours because I already worked for eight hours, right? Like we need some balance there. <laughs> yeah. It was never supposed to be a one person job. You know, we, we used to live in villages to where the meals yeah. were a collective effort that everyone mm-hmm. shared. And now, so every single one of us have the pressure of taking a job that was always five plus people and now it's just you and if you have Mm -hmm. children that you're trying to like juggle and you're ADHD and you're you know having a rough day Mm -hmm. and it's just you end up crying over your food the whole time (laughs) have you heard of um, ADHD organizing the fridge no but I okay well no not that term but I did see something recently it was like put the condiments in the produce drawer because if you need mustard you'll go get mustard but like put the things that are perishable like in front of you yes so that's what okay. I and it's helped a ton so we put all of our uh, the condiments and the sauces and the stuff that you know that you have but you're willing to go look for right in the back and in the drawers and the hard pla- to see places and you put everything that's perishable and things that need to be eaten up front and in the doors, which is a little controversial for some people with some things because the doors uh, are the least regulated. So the perishable thing, right. but I mean, eat it faster, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> More of a priority. Yeah. I'm, that's the nice thing about leftovers. I love leftovers. I have no problem with leftovers. The problem is I forget about it. <laughs> or it's because yes. even though I use like the glass containers that you can see in, mm-hmm. it gets pushed back. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, oh, I have nothing to eat. Like, <laughs> and it's like, no, you actually have many meals that are now not good, but like <laughs> you did. <laughs> yeah, it's hard, but it's a learning curve. And what, it, you know, it's it's made harder because there's so much information out mm-hmm. there about it all. And and that's why I tell people, like, the honestly, the best thing that you can do is to stop trying to find all of the information and just start mm-hmm. to implement um, yeah. something. And yeah. where I tell people to start is just try to get more fruits and vegetables in what you're already eating. Mm-hmm. And so you can totally take the you know, mac and cheese and then just yes. uh, make some saute some broccoli up or something, add to it. Or um, here's, here's one, uh, frozen pizza. You can totally add onions and peppers and mushrooms to a just regular frozen pizza. And that mm-hmm. was life changing for me. So it doesn't, and it doesn't matter if you have to drench the carrots in ranch if in the beginning, as long as you're getting in the carrots, it doesn't matter that you have to dip your strawberries in Nutella to be able to eat them. Mm-hmm. Good job on getting in the strawberries. Yeah. And you got to focus on what you're doing well and trying to maximize uh, the nutrition that you are getting into your body mm-hmm. first. And the more it's like a crowding out, you, you, the more you get in the good stuff, your body will start going, oh, you know, I feel a lot better when I get that stuff over when I get that stuff. And it'll start, you'll start leaning more towards the fruits mm-hmm. and vegetables. And you'll be like, wow, I didn't think I liked Brussels sprouts, but maybe I do. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And the mac and cheese with the broccoli is like the first thing I always suggest too. Like 
it's nutrition by addition. And I think we're so used to being like, well, cut this out and cut that out and eat less of this. But it's like, okay, yeah, maybe you could, you know, use to eat more fruits and vegetables, but it doesn't mean we have to like replace. We Mm -hmm. can add, Mm -hmm. like you said, and like to what we're already doing. If maybe like, oh, when you make tacos, like make some beans with it. Or like you said, put the stuff on the pizza. Like, it ramen. doesn't have to ramen. Yes. Ramen okay. I think I think it's super underrated to make yeah. like ramen with and add like veggies into it or a protein, like make it more of a meal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's super underrated. I think being able to just add in, it doesn't have to be like a side of veggies in our meat in our carb like all separate like mixed dishes are still healthy I don't know where like we got this idea that like if it's all mixed together or it tastes really good like now it's now it's not healthy um like I had a client recently we were talking about like she has a few kids and some of the issue is right like trying to make meals that everyone likes and that you know getting her kids to eat more fruits and vegetables slowly like for ones that are a little, you know, picky or have some kind of sensory stuff going on. And, you know, I said, if there's raviolis with spinach in the middle, like that counts, Mm -hmm. like that there's nutrients there. Like, Mm -hmm. is that a whole serving of spinach? Maybe not, but it's something, right? Like if we're comparing it to just you know, no veggie, right? Just like plain ravioli, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But like, if we're trying to get in those little things, because you have kiddos that, you know, aren't going to sit down and eat a bowl of broccoli, Mm -hmm. then like, yeah, that's how we can do that. Add it to the mac and cheese, mix it up. So it's covered in that sauce or dipping in a branch, like adding a sauce or the dip or whatever, like, it doesn't negate the nutrients. Like, I feel like we have this idea that like, one negates the other. Like if I'm not eating it, if I add the ranch, then like I don't get the nutrients from the broccoli. It's not as quote unquote good. That's not true. Like it probably just tastes better. Like, I don't know about you, but plain broccoli is kind of like, it's a weird texture. It's a little dry. Like that's not really enjoyable, at least for me. Like, and also certain vitamins and minerals like need that fat to be absorbed. Mm -hmm. And so that's why actually dressing on a salad is so important because that helps the whole process. Like, I think we just come to this point where we're so divided on like eating perfectly, eating the quote unquote right way. And we've negated like enjoyment of food and just like, it doesn't have to be so complicated or uncomfortable or hard. And it can be like easier and enjoyable and eating what you actually like instead of what the internet is like, this is the superfood of the week. <laughs> the week. Like- like or the day like honestly I lose track but it's like I think one recently like oh my god I can't think of like I know like acai bowls were like really popular and I like like acai but also like I'm not making that at home like that's like a whole ordeal so like it's fine you don't need to go buy a powder to add it into your whatever like just eat the vegetables that you like like if you don't like brussels sprouts don't eat brussels sprouts but like, if you like them, then that's great. Like if you don't like, I feel like cauliflower is like a big thing right now and cottage cheese. I know it's not a vegetable, but just like a food that people are talking about on social media. Like it's like, okay, well, if you don't like cottage cheese, like it's okay. Like it's fine. It's not a big deal. You know? Yeah. You have to figure out what works for you and Mm -hmm. don't give up on a certain food. If you try it, even a couple of times and you're like eh yeah I always put the luckily my husband's a great cook and <laughs> so about two times a week he'll be home for uh to cook dinner and mm-hmm. we always have these like big proteins and all the the individual side items and again mm-hmm. when you mentioned it earlier you know we think that having a protein and a couple of side items and then your carb for ADHD people, that's a nightmare. That's so now I can't. That's not only one meal. That's four meals. That's four different meals that I'm having to cook at one time to make one right. meal. You're crazy, but <laughs> not a big deal to him. And uh, just to get introduced with stuff and everything, I make my children. You have to have 
at least a bite of everything that we made on your plate. Now, does that mean I'm going to stand over you and make you eat it? No. It's on your plate, though, because if it's not on your plate, you're sure not going to eat it. And uh, if you don't like it like this, well, we cooked it different this time. Try it like this. Mm -hmm. Well, we cooked it different this time. Try it again. And then mm -hmm. we teach them that how our taste buds change. And uh, because they do, they change from yeah. when you're a kid to when you're a teenager to when you're an adult. And, mm -hmm. you know, even with uh, stuff like pregnancy makes your ch taste buds change. So like with each pregnancy I had, my whole palate changed and things that mm -hmm. I loved, I couldn't even stand the texture or taste of anymore and mm -hmm. vice versa. So even if you've grown your whole life, like my husband was really bad for the longest time, he'd be like, uh, no, I don't like broccoli. Well, when's the last time you tried it? Well, I don't know. I was like 12. Dude, right, yeah. the 30s now. Maybe give it another chance. <laughs> yeah, I stuck. We get so stuck. And I think especially like Brussels sprouts you mentioned earlier, it's one of those things. It's like people are like, oh, I hate Brussels sprouts. They're so smelly. And I'm like, well, how did your mom or dad or whoever cooked for you cook Brussels sprouts? Well, they boiled them and they were stinky. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's gross. Like, <laughs> right. Or in my opinion. So, but I was like, have you tried them roasted where they're like almost charred? Like that's my favorite way to eat yeah. them. It's kind of like one of those things, like a lot of times people's, version of vegetables is like a steamed bag of vegetables uh -huh. with no seasoning which, which no seasoning no and which seeds. is if right if you dig <laughs> that then that's fine but like if you don't I there's nothing wrong with you like you're right not, there's nothing there's wrong with you you want a little food. flavor like <laughs> and you don't want them all mushy like you know <laughs> Brussels sprouts in specific too are so versatile. You can drench mm -hmm. them in honey and cinnamon and they're delicious. And you can mm -hmm. also put them like put garlic and cheese. There's so many different ways you can eat Brussels sprouts. Just in yeah. specific. But I also heard that um uh, the Brussels sprouts we have now are not the same Brussels sprouts that our parents and grandparents had, that they've been so uh -huh. genetically modified as everything has these days that they don't taste near as bad as they did back in the day. Oh, okay. So maybe like they were stinkier at one point. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, like I think just... Like you said, being open to trying it again. And I think they say for kids, like when you're introducing foods, like you have to try something like seven times mm -hmm. before you can really definitely be like, I don't like it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's more like, because it's, you know, like you said, it tastes so different, cooked different ways, or just because over time, like we change our taste buds change. And especially as young kids, like that's happening so rapidly. Yes. And it really like, you can't just make that determination like, oh, you had one bite and you're like, nope, like I'm never eating that again my entire life. Another thing that I use for all of this is to treat it like medicine. Um, mm. We're so, what's the word, culturalized, socialized, mm -hmm. programmed to think that everything has to taste good all the time. And like, is it important for your food to taste good? Absolutely. But also it's not a it shouldn't be a make it or break it type of thing um mm. for example you know when I try to give my kids medicine there's only like this one type of medicine that they like and but that type of medicine is only good for this type of sickness so if you have right. that type of sickness I'm sorry this is the only medicine for it and they'll be like I don't like this well I mean it's not supposed to be for your enjoyment it's supposed to be for your health, you know, to make you better. And food is medicine in the same sense. So even if I don't like something, I can generally make, like, it's very rare I find something that I cannot make myself eat um, mm. because I have this mindset of, well, I don't have to eat like a whole helping of it, but I bet specific vitamins and nutrients in this particular actual vegetable um mm -hmm. is something that my body would appreciate in some form or yeah. fashion so just to kind of make sure I don't have any nutritional deficiencies okay. um 
it's okay if I force myself to eat two or three bites of this right here. Yeah. And I think also like understanding like two or three bites is better than none. Mm -hmm. Um, Like if that's all you can handle. And something I like to remind people too is like, because some people are very like, I really enjoy fruit or I really enjoy vegetables and kind of depending on if they like that sweeter or more savory taste. And you can get most of the nutrients you need from one or the other is both great. Absolutely. Like that's the ideal situation. But sometimes for that texture, that taste, like you mentioned, can be really difficult. And so sometimes that means like, okay, we can get vitamin C from both vegetables and we can get, you know, potassium from vegetables and fruit and kind of identifying those foods. And so maybe if like one version, you're like, I really hate this. And like you said, like getting a few bites in, that's awesome. And like, can we get it from a different source that maybe you can eat a little more of? Mm -hmm. And just like, it doesn't have to be like, I honestly, other than banana bread, I don't like bananas. It's a texture thing. I hate, I don't like the stringies. Like I I don't like bananas. (laughs) So like for me, like I'm just like, you know, I feel like growing up, it was like, oh, you're not going to get enough potassium. Mm -hmm. Like bananas aren't the only food that have potassium, right? Like we can make sure we're filling those gaps in other places. And yeah, sometimes it comes down to like, okay, maybe I need to eat a few bites of something that I like is not my favorite. It happens, right? That is like a reality. And like, I love that like food is so versatile when we learn more about it, we can really fill those gaps in ways that you'll probably enjoy if you like, you know, most fruits and vegetables. And like, it doesn't have to be so like cut and dry. Like this is the only food or you're not eating this food. You're going to be deficient type of thing, you know? Absolutely. Uh, Smoothies are really versatile. Oh my God. Yes. When you're talking about the acai bowls earlier, my mouth's watering. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Acai bowls are one of the things that I can... I can, I can eat really well and process really mm-hmm. well. My body does really well on because a lot of stuff, um, as soon as I eat, I crash. I can go, go, mm-hmm. go, go, go with energy. And as soon as I eat anything, I'm ready for a nap. But acai bowls don't do that to me. And uh, mm-hmm. they come in little, because they did, you can get the powder and then you have to like mix it together. And you're right, that is way more complicated than any of us mm-hmm. want to be. But in the frozen section now, they have these little smoothie packets. So they're just little um, single serve smoothie packets and they come in a whole bag of them. So you get like 10 Mm -hmm. plus of these little acai smoothie packets and you just throw that in the blender blender, and then any kind of other fruits and vegetables that you want to Mm -hmm. go in there and add a little juice. And then I eat mine with a scoop of peanut butter for Mm. protein and that's just absolutely wonderful another convenience meal i like is peanut butter and yogurt and you can get Mm -hmm. all sorts of yogurt now that's high in protein and i have to focus a lot on protein because i have uh the hypoglycemia problems so Mm -hmm. my body thinks it needs like 120 grams of protein a day or it starts to whine and uh you just take a, a spoonful of peanut and to so you can get little peanut butter cups that are single serve yep. peanut butter cups. I go to Sam's Club and buy a whole, whole case of those at a time. Mm-hmm. Now, um, peanut butter with my yogurt and peanut butter with my uh, fruit and make whole meals out of that. Absolutely. And I think you mentioned the protein and yeah, protein helps our body absorb the carbohydrates slower just like you said to give that more even energy Mm -hmm. and so does fat and I think with yogurt specifically something that I started doing whole milk yogurt is completely not talked about enough I think whole milk yogurt is the best and that's just like some people may disagree that's fine Um, but for me, it, like you said, helps me, it adds a little more to the yogurt on top of whatever else I'm having it with to keep fuller longer. So it's a little, you know, has a little extra calories, a little extra fat. And I think the texture is really great. Like whole milk Greek yogurt just has a smoother texture. It's not so, not so tart, um, unless you like really like that about it. Um, but I think that's just one of those things like we can add fat and protein to those meals, like you said, to help us feel full. And I think fat is one of those things that gets this like bad rep, but like, it's really important for us, especially 
for women, like with just reproductive health and hormones. And it is for men too, but women especially, like fat is so, so important. And there was such a campaign against it for so mm-hmm. long. Everything for like 25 plus, it's still, it's still, you walk through the mm-hmm. yogurt aisle, especially, and it's like fat free, fat free, fat yes. free. And what people don't realize is that I'm really big into languages and Mm -hmm. I only speak like a couple. So I'm only taking this for face value of what I've been told. Mm -hmm. But our language is the only one where fat in your food is the same word as fat on your body. So Mm. people see that and they automatically think that the fat in your food translates to fat on your body and it's going to stick when it's not true. There's several different types of fat there's saturated and unsaturated and that's what you need to the trans and you have to pay attention to what kind of fat that you're getting because you're absolutely right we need more of it for processes that our body needs to do yeah that's really interesting I didn't know that and yeah that's very interesting I think you're right like people do think that it's like oh if I eat fat yeah it's just like automatically stored on my body um when in reality right that's not how that works and so important for so many processes and you mentioned the yogurt like it's saying fat free low fat I think one of the most frustrating things I found for a while was trying to like I like to buy the tub of um yogurt but like I also like the variety of flavors so occasionally like I do like you know getting the different the single serve cups of yogurt but Trader Joe's is the only place I can find yogurt in the cup that is whole milk. Like I have looked at every other grocery store, Publix. I'm in North Carolina. So like Publix, Ingles, Food Lion, everywhere. Hair's Teeter. And it's only like fat free or low fat. And I'm like, I just want whole milk yogurt. And you have to buy the giant tub. And it's like, sometimes I just want two yogurt cups for the week. I don't want a whole tub of yogurt. Mm -hmm. But, you know, because for some reason that's like not available or it's available in plain only Mm -hmm. that, you know, a lot of people don't even realize like whole milk yogurt is a thing because I certainly didn't really think about it because that's, it's like low fat or fat free. And like, you don't really think much beyond that from what's available in the store. Yeah. And the more you learn the you'll find that it's actually really hard to find the things that you're looking for in the mm-hmm. store more often. Oh, yeah. It's, it's so hard to, I've had to navigate it with a, being allergic to soy. That mm-hmm. was a hard navigation <laughs> because everything has it Mm -hmm. so you get down there and you're like okay and that you know that's the problem with diet culture they're like okay so cut out this cut out that cut out that and the thing I hear the most is okay well what can I eat because when I talk Mm -hmm. about my soy allergy that's always the first thing people say like well what can you eat yeah and it's it was hard to navigate in the beginning and Mm -hmm. as anything is it's going to be a learning curve but you start to figure out the patterns and what works mm-hmm. for you the more you explore. And I, I really recommend keeping a food journal because, you know, again, the hardest part of most things is remembering. Mm-hmm. So writing it down helps you keep track of this and that. And for the longest time, I'd be like, I, my food journal is so in-depth that it had all the restaurants that I went to and what I could eat at the restaurants. So I would, mm-hmm. I knew exactly what my options are when I went where. And then um, mm-hmm. I knew that I could get this yogurt at this store and that this store didn't have that yogurt, but it did have this and that one doesn't have this. So, and, you know, again, I hated to uh, store hop. I, I, I couldn't stand a store hop. Mm -hmm. I like go over here for a couple of things and then go over there for a couple of things that drove me crazy but now that I've been doing it for years um not store hopping that's not I don't store hop I can't stand to do that but I've learned that okay well this week I was able to make it to Publix so this is what I get at Publix and then which Mm -hmm. I let I let Publix tell me what to eat I, I just go in there and um whatever's on sale that I can have is what I'll right. get and a lot of times like uh 
the olive bar stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, which is pricey, yes. But I'm learning that most of what's on the pricey olive bar comes in jars over next to the pickles. Mm-hmm. So you go over there and you can just kind of navigate and look and see what they have. And uh, yeah, whatever's on sale is what I what I, I do. I dig that. I, yeah. I mean, that's a, a lot of why, like, I think grocery shopping can feel so difficult because it can be... We're, like, the only country that has so, so many options. Like, you go into one aisle and there's, like, 500 mac and cheeses. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, that isn't really a reality anywhere else but here. (laughs) Um, But it's overwhelming. But it also, the psychology behind grocery store food placement is insane if you, like, go down that rabbit hole of, like, And even beyond, like, price of, like, oh, expensive things, mid-range to expensive is eye level, and the cheap stuff is, you know, kind of on the floor, Mm -hmm. um, so that you, you know, don't really, quote-unquote, see it. But even just, like, the things that are on sale and the placement of things and how, like, the price for a company to put something somewhere is more expensive if it's in a more desirable area and this and that, and it's just insane and I don't really like to hop on like the narrative of like oh big food and all this stuff because like I think it's not that it's not true but just it can be very overwhelming like you said and it's like a rabbit hole I don't need to go down to make my food choices but there is something about like the psychology of the grocery store and of eating and similar to social media like oh don't like eat this or that and being able to be like, what do I like? Mm -hmm. Like I've worked with so many clients that maybe they have a binge food that is ice cream or something basically that society has deemed bad, unhealthy, right? And once they've healed the relationship with food, they're like, I don't even really like Oreos that much. They're like, they're good, but they're not like my favorite dessert by far. But because we put on this emphasis on these foods or certain things, it like really affects us in a way that, you know, is kind of unclear until you sit down and unpack it. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's just crazy because it's unlike anything else. Like when you have maybe a poor relationship with alcohol or drugs or all these things, we can be absent from those behaviors, but we can't, we have to eat. Mm -hmm. So like we just end up in this kind of, bad relationship with food because well I have to eat something I can't just not eat at all Mm -hmm. but we have all these views and perceptions of things that are affecting how we feel when we eat what we're choosing to eat how much we're eating or not eating Mm -hmm. you know yeah you you land in a limbo for sure and don't know which way to go Mm -hmm. food is so complex not Mm -hmm. only in the external complexities Mm -hmm. of the propaganda and manipulation that they're totally doing for us but as emotional um Mm -hmm. like you know comfort food being oreos for example and so anytime they're any kind of not whatever then they turn to oreos and you start unpacking that and it turns out they never actually even liked oreos it's just the only time they felt connected to their mom was over oreos so Mm -hmm. they stuck with it and yeah perpetuating that pattern in a hopes of feeling comfort that it, and it's a sense of false cover comfort that's right. self-sabotaging and but you don't realize any of that until you mm-hmm. start trying to unpack it and which is again why I recommend a food journal to not only track what you're eating and how it makes you feel but to question yourself like you know if you notice that you've been eating Oreos a lot and it's bothering you that you are or you mm. feel like it's a problem right sit down with that and try to dissect it you know just write on a piece of paper why is this bothering me and just start rambling through writing to yourself people get hung up on journaling because they're like oh I'm not a good writer or I'm not a good speller or whatever whatever Mm -hmm. it it don't it doesn't have to make a bit of sense you can just start putting words down that as long as it makes sense to you 
And it's helping you navigate your thoughts and emotions and backtrack them all the way to what's causing this or that. Mm -hmm. And is it true? Is it helpful? Because that's something that I cover a lot is it doesn't really matter if it's true or not. Mm -hmm. The question is, is, is it helpful or not? Is this belief serving you or is it harming you? We could, we could go on for another hour. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's honestly crazy. And I think just to kind of bring it full circle, like, yeah, a lot of times those, those habits are because we don't have other coping skills or like you said, we're trying to connect to something that we don't realize. And we turn to food because it's quote unquote safe. It's not going to harm us, but mm -hmm. it can still be a, a form of self, you know, it's not going to harm us in the sense of like overdosing on drugs or drinking, you know, too much. And so like we turn to that in a quote unquote safe way, but it can still be self-harm, self-harming mm -hmm. um, with that intention. Yeah. Food is super in intimate. Um, it's intertwined in everything that we are as people because you are what you eat. Right. And that doesn't only mean like it's so deep. It's so deep, it's just so from deep. an energetic standpoint. If It doesn't matter what you're trying to heal. It doesn't matter if you're trying to heal a physical ailment or mm -hmm. if you're trying to heal a trauma that happened mm -hmm. when you were a kid. Food is a great way to gain control over that and start mm -hmm. throwing the momentum in a direction that you want. Because if you start figuring out what's good, what what works for your body specifically mm -hmm. ignore what everybody else says works for them that's great for them I'm glad yep. they're working on that um it has nothing to do with you you can take their suggestions and experiment with them but do not ever take anything for face value until you've tried it out and talked to your body and how it makes you feel exactly. but once you start figuring that out you cultivate that relationship with yourself um, on a mental physical spiritual holistic plane of existence and you start it, it brings a sense of uh improved self-esteem and comfort with yourself and you become proud of yourself because you made a good choice today and mm -hmm. you know that's do not beat yourself up over choices that you would label as poor there are no mm -hmm. poor choices and good choices. Everything's just choices and beating yourself up over things that aren't perfect is not helpful. Just be aware of it. And since you're aware of it, you're like, well, oops. Um, okay. And a little forethought, you know, on my next yeah. decision, how am I going to, you know, I'll make a good decision this evening. What's my next mm -hmm. opportunity to make a good decision? Let me go ahead and start planning it out in my head so that I can be proud of myself for making that good decision. And it starts healing your relationship with yourself and it starts in healing the relationship with yourself, heals the relationships you have with everybody else. And it just mm -hmm. echoes out from there. Absolutely. All right. So this was wonderful. Um, like I said, I could keep on and keep on, but we'll spare people. <laughs> <laughs> We can always do another episode if you ever wanted to come back on the show. I'd be happy to have you. Uh, Absolutely. Would you like to tell people how they can find you? Yeah, of course. So I hang out on Instagram at uh, Sammy, S A M M I B dot nutrition. And then on my website, I have um, a lot of free resources as well, um, as well as if you want to work one on one with a dietitian. And that is sammybnutrition.com. Awesome. And I'll make sure that all of that's linked really close by so nobody has to look too hard. Because again, awesome. yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you for being here. Samantha Berkowitz, everyone, go follow her. And if you need any help with your food habits, reach out to either her or myself. We can both help you. Just let us know what you need. I have a food journal for purchase, available for purchase on the Patreon. It's like $7 or something. I, you can just as easily get you a pretty notebook and start taking notes. I have it set up. It's like five pages or something. And you just print out however many pages you need they, so you can repeat them week after week. I'm, I'm going to add some pages to it. So stay tuned for all of that. 
this episode really sparked some ideas that I can add to that to kind of help you out with like grocery shopping and restaurants and meal prepping and that kind of stuff. New services options going up on the website if you're interested in working with me. There are a various host of things we can, again, my topic is healing and that pretty much just encompasses all areas of life. So it's kind of hard to pin down exactly um, what service I have. I don't like the word coaching, you know? So I guess I'm a coach, but I don't like that word. I'm more of an alchemist that's cooler, more magical. So various directions of alchemy that we can explore together if you're interested. But until next week, love you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Namaste.